All right, let's go ahead and get started. So um, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, I know we typically do webinars on Wednesdays, but we're actually launching this new series uh, called a vendor series. So these are kind of two part series to introduce uh, leading um, you know, software and also solution partners, uh, one with a use case, the other with a technical deep dive. And we are joined today by Nationwide Insurance, who will be talking about data virtualization. So, you know, thanks again for joining and um, we're going to go ahead and kick this off. Uh, so just a quick overview of the agenda. We have, um, you know, about five minutes or so for some administrative items and introductions. Then we will jump into the discussion with our three speakers today, and then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, so if you have questions, feel free to start, um, you know, putting in your questions throughout the entire discussion, and, and we'll get to them at the end. <clears throat> and then finally, five minutes at the end to uh, close this out and show you where to find um, the recording. So as I mentioned, this is a brand new series uh, format that we're doing, and I'm actually really excited about it. Um, it's a vendor series. It's free. And, um, you know, like I said, it, it features leading analytics product and solution companies. So this whole background of the series is, is meant to introduce different topics and techniques within the analytics industry and show you what different types of tools and, and use cases exist out there. So like I said before, this is a, this is delivered in a two part webinar that covers a use case, which will be covered today and also a technical deep dive into the tool. Um, or the solution specifically. Uh, and then we will be hosting these every month. So you can join us every month for this vendor series and, and get introduced to um, these different topics. A uh, little bit about women in analytics if you're new. So we are an organization that um, increases visibility to women in the analytics space. Um, and we also have a membership platform that you can join and participate in our community. And a little bit about the tool that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, our series partner for today and Thursday is Denoto. They are a core technology to enable modern data integration and data management solutions, which you will learn quite a bit about today. Um, and fun fact, they were recently named a leader in the 2020 Gartner Magic Quadrant for data integration tools. Um, they're an excellent tool and I'm actually really, really excited to be uh, talking about them today. Um, so a little bit on webinar tips. So if you're having any audio issues, please chat, use the chat or email us at info at women in um, If you have a question, like I said, please feel free to put your Q&A, participate, ask questions, you know, while you have these experts on the line. And then if you want to participate even further, I know they have a decent amount of polls and questions and quizzes to ask you. So keep an eye out for that because we will be launching those polls throughout the discussion. Um, and I just want to do a quick introduction of the speakers that we have today. Like I said, all three of them are from Nationwide. Um, so first and foremost, we have Yi Chang, who has been in IT analytics professional at Nationwide for five years. Uh, through her career, she used her statistical analytics background and data engineering skills to provide end-to-end -end data solutions for IT and business areas. She developed metrics and dashboards that drive changes for process and behaviors. She is well-versed in automation and optimization of data pipeline. She is a Lean Six Sigma black belt and has led major process improvement projects. Outside of her job, Yi led Team Ravija to win Nationwide Hackathon. She spoke at multiple conferences. She serves as a mentor for Masters of Business Analytics program, and she uses her optimization skills uh, for, for her cooking and grocery trip planning. <laughs> That's awesome. Welcome, Yi. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Sabitha Darcy, who has been a technology area leader, system architect, project architect, and tech lead with overall 15 plus years of IT experience, including eight years of development experience in the integration and governance space. She has expertise in the area of data integration, data management, data governance, cloud, DevOps, innovation, packaged applications, and data security with extensive experience in providing solutions for enterprise needs. She has been working as lead data arch or lead architect and tech lead for multiple complex projects, managing planning and different phases of DDIT. She also has experience in developing strategies, defining goal, target, state architecture, data integration and data management, package applications, software selection process, providing innovate, innovative solutions, code development, maintenance, production support, upgrades, migration. 
Sabitha Darcy volunteered and led several hunger relief programs, participated in hackathons, provided innovation ideas, and implemented the ideas. She also mentored several associates, contractors, and interns. She's an active participant and volunteered at several all-women ARG groups and represented nationwide at other women conferences. Um, thanks so much, Sabitha, for being here as well. Thanks, Reagan. Uh, and last but definitely not least, we have Jajith uh, Shrikumari, and he has 18 years of IT experience in end-to-end -end implementation of data warehouse applications. He is well-versed in data modeling, translating the business user's information requirements into logical data models for data warehouses, and then work with the integration engineers to facilitate getting data in and report tool designers to get useful information out of the data warehouse. He is adept in automation and optimization of data engineering pipelines. He is also a certified business intelligence uh, professional. Welcome, Jajith, and thanks for being here as well. Thank you. Y'all have a pretty extensive background in this topic, so I'm really, really excited to hear from all of you. And I will uh, stop talking and let you all take it from here. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And, um, you know, this is going to be an excellent discussion about data virtualization. And please throw in your, your questions throughout the entire talk, and we'll get to them at the end. All right. Uh, let me start a sharing. Right. Can everyone see my screen well? Yep. All right. And thank you for having us today, Reagan, and everybody. Welcome to our session. So uh, first, I would like to set your expectations, what you can actually get out from this session. First of all, you'll gain a superpower to explain a data capability to anyone, like literally your kids, your neighbor, anyone. And second, you'll hear a true story on how we struggled and built our virtual market to conquer a real world data problem. And last but not least, you'll get inspired to solve your data and maybe your life problems. So are you all ready? I know you all are, but before we dive into the session, I have one question for all of you. How many toilet paper rolls are in your house right now? Remain your seat, you don't have to leave to check. And I'll tell you it was down to one at mine last week. I didn't stock up on it back in March because I was not as smart. So I need to get some. Glad I knew exactly what I need and where to get it. Everyone seems to have a very personal preference to toilet paper. Since I need to get out, I'd better also grab a fan that my husband wanted for his den. He works on a desktop all day so the room gets pretty hot. Anyway, I went to Costco. I'm very familiar with it. I know that seasonal electronics is usually at the center front and then toilet paper is usually at the back right corner. So it should be easy for me. In and out in about 10 minutes, grab and go. However, it did not carry any fan. And what's worse, there's no toilet paper at the back aisle. The closest I could find was paper towel. I don't think that's going to work, right? So I thought maybe they had moved toilet paper to a different corner. The warehouse was so big without a map. So I had to wander around, but only to get more steps in. And finally, I found staff who confirmed toilet paper was out of stock. It is commodity nowadays, he said. So what should I do? I didn't expect toilet paper scarcity lasted this long. Should I go check another store? And what if they are out as well? So I messaged my friends, Sabitha and Gigi's. Sabitha suggested Walmart and Target because I could check their store inventory online. Good, so I did. I found the closest Walmart that had my toilet paper was eight miles away. And the Target that carried fans was 10 miles away, but in an opposite direction. So should I hit the road now? What do you all think? Well, then Gigi's responded, hey, what about buying online? How urgent do you need it? Oh yeah, why not? 
Kids are just so used to grab toilet paper from Costco. Now 30 miles versus shopping online. Smart audience, take a wild guess what I chose. Save the drive, of course. I went home, browsed online, and ordered both the toilet paper and the fan together. They were delivered in two days. So glad I still had that one roll to last. But wouldn't it be better if my area supported two hour delivery instead? So what does this experience tell me? I was so used to grab toilet paper from the warehouse, but when pandemic hits, the shopping routine stopped working. I could drive around for 30 more miles, or I should realize the option to shop toilet paper online. Now you may wonder how toilet paper relates to data and analytics. Well, they are both commodities nowadays. The end, oh, just kidding. They're both commodities for sure. And just like the pandemic now, I got an urgent request, show the latest sales trend, like I need toilet paper. So I might also get marketing activity data and sales di dimensions, just like the fan I would also like to grab. So my instinct told me, hey, there's a sales data mart, AKA Costco, you should have the data cleaned and modeled. But then when I actually get into the data mart, I found sales data was aggregated weekly, though I needed it daily. So not in stock. It had the dimension, it did not have marketing data. What should I do? Well, I could submit a request to the data mart team and to get it added, just like wait for Costco to restock. Maybe it'll get approved. And next year, by the end of 2021, they'll have everything loaded. Or Sabisa mentioned, hey, there are two other databases. So the warm-up stores real-time sales, and the other target has marketing data. Although they're not modeled, I just need to map it myself. No big deal, my SQL skill is sufficient. And then you just say, hey, wait, they're in different database systems. Oh crap, I need to pull them all separately, just like adding 30 miles to my trip. Now I wish I could have a similar online shopping experience. Somewhere listed all the catalog and inventory in real time. So I could access on this one single platform without physically driving around for data errands. The hope once order was placed, just like my SQL got executed, the data result got delivered to me, not in two days, not in two hours, but in real So free instant data delivery, is that possible? Well, yes, otherwise we won't call for this session. And all we need is the help from data virtualization. And then you can shop your data in this one unified platform and get a real-time result. So for the rest of the session, I'm going to show you what it is and how we adopt here at Nationwide. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. All right. Thanks, E. That was a great analogy I, that everyone has, uh, can relate to, especially during this quarantine period. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about what is data virtualization, what are the do's and don'ts of a data virtualization capability, and some of the approved use cases at our organization. So before I do that, um, I'll start with the definition of data virtualization. Uh, it's a long definition, but I want to make sure um, I read it through this definition of data virtualization and then make it simpler for you guys. So data virtualization is the process of abstracting, transforming, federating, and delivering the data contained within variety of sources for access by consuming applications or users when requested without regard to their physical storage or heterogeneous structure. So what is this simply means? It means uh, 3CI usually use connect, combine, and consume. So as you can see this in picture, um, it connects to a variety of data sources. Um, it could connect to cloud uh, object stores, on-premise databases. Um, so if you have a S3 or if you have uh, 
cloud blob storage, uh, any cloud data warehouse stream or analytic engines, um, Snowflake, Redshift, um, you know, Athena or any of the other connections, uh, any on-premise data is Oracle, Teradata, NatTeza, SQL Server uh, files. Um, you can usually connect through the virtualization, NoSQL, uh, databases or any SaaS application. So a variety of data sources, including streaming and uh, other data sources, right? So you connect to this variety of data sources. Then the next step here is the combined part of it where all the magic of data virtualization happens. So as you can see, it uh, brings in all this data in real time into this virtualized layer where you are um, going through a lightweight transformation where uh, it will be uh, transformation logic filtering, joining, or any other additional logic that you want to put into this layer to create your unified or abstract um, semantic layer. So here um, you can see uh, data, uh, it also uh, stays in original data sources, only um, bring in like on demand by triggering in from these multiple sources. And then um, it, is, it is actually retrieved uh, in memory and then uh, process all the queries that is needed for end user consumption. So it, it's just the, it provides the logical view, like I told, talked about the semantic um, layer, which eliminates the data silos and it provides real-time access and improves speed and decision making. So there is additional capability supporting functionality with regards to the security, uh, where you can control um, the access at different granularity. You can obfuscate the data or mask the data at, uh, you know, as you expose this data to different consumers. So the next part of it is the consumption. So once you create this view in the virtualized layer, you can expose that data uh, via APIs or through JDBC connectors or other protocols. You can also enable self-service reporting here for your end users. Um, you know, data services can be created uh, with the information that they want in real time. And uh, on top of it, uh, end user can build their own dashboards reports, which they can customize according to their needs. So the Adding a new data source is very quick um, as it can be easily created in a matter of minutes in the data virtualized data layer. So this is uh, about, um, you know, a, as simple as it could get about uh, the data virtualization. It's a connect, combine, and consume. So what, what are some of the other things that we want to provide guidance on here in this session is, uh, specific to what we enabled or provided in within our organization and your organization might have different standards and practices and that's okay. Um, so is data virtualization some of the misconsumptions uh, is, is uh, can I do um, you know, uh, replace uh, my ETL tool with data virtualization. So um, ETL is used physically to move the data uh, to uh, from point A to point B and store it in your data warehouse or data marts or data uh, bases. And it, uh, this is not a replacement uh, capability for ETL. Um, although it can um, uh, provide or complement a data uh, a virtualization layer in the acquisition layer um, or in um, consumption layer, but it is not an ETL tool. So ETL tool persists the data, like I mentioned, and whereas the virtualization does not persist the data, um, although there is some caching functionality that we have, uh, it is not uh, meant to be like a physical persistence store. So the next one is, um, it's um, data virtualization sometimes can be misunderstood for data visualization. So data visualization, uh, if you haven't um, uh, used any of the visualization tools out there like Tableau or other tools, it is a graphical representation of the information and data. Uh, so by using visual elements like charts, graphs, maps, or um, any other elements like uh, which provides an easy accessible way to see and understand the trends. 
outliers and patterns in data. So data visualization, uh, virtualization definitely provides information here to the visualization. It can consume from a virtualized layer, uh, but it is not, data visualization is not providing the visualization capability. So last here that I have is, um, I already talked a little bit about uh, if you are looking to um, have a persistent data store, either it's going to be uh, Oracle, SQL Server, or DB2, uh, data virtualization is not a data store, right? It's not a database. Um, it is retrieved uh, on demand. It, it stores in on memory. It does a um, lot of uh, wonderful things to make your views real time uh, and uh, put that integrated logic, uh, but it is not a database or data store. So um, if caching is enabled, uh, for, it has a a uh, lot of data visualization capabilities uh, we mentioned like here can enable caching uh, uh, for non-functional reasons. Say you have a big table and it has billions of da data that you don't want to bring in every day. Uh, you might enable uh, you know, a temporary cache or bring in the data uh, and uh, use that for uh, combining with other real-time data. It improves the performance, but it is not uh, a uh, you know, permanent data store that you want to use it. So next, I'm going to talk about some of the use cases um, that uh, we have either uh, in use or um, approved and planning to use in the future at, uh, at our organization. So the first one is the uh, virtual abstraction layer. I think uh, this is the most common one we have seen that uh, you know several areas are looking for is creating that abstract layer and exposing that uh, in the consumption layer, right? So this uh, this actually involves uh, combining the data from different heterogeneous uh, data sources, um, doing a light transformation like joining it, and then uh, creating exposing that view. Where we have seen like uh, through exposing as a data as an API uh, kind of use case, and we have also have other uh, applications consuming this from the abstract layer. So the next one here is extending, um, you know, your warehouse or you know, creating a logical data warehouse. So a lot of times uh, in our big organization, we have like a lot of data sitting in our data warehouse and to add or modify the data warehouse can be very expensive. And uh, if you uh, build this logical data warehouse, it's easy to understand uh, and it makes it easier and less expensive uh, for the consumers. Um, the next one is the migration and transition architecture. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, folks are um, either actually already in cloud or planning to move in the cloud or in the hybrid mode. Uh, this really helps, uh, especially to help with some of the cloud migration hybrid use cases where you uh, want to put data virtualization um, as an abstract layer while you're going through this uh, transition um, architecture or the migration from one system to other system in the background. So you minimize the impact for the downstream uh, systems. And uh, this is especially uh, you, if you're doing between your on-premise or cloud, let's say you're moving from one system to other system because you're upgrading or you're moving re-platforming um, or you're doing, uh, uh, you know, some migration effort there that really helps with the uh, putting a virtualized layer so you're not have to worry about changing everything down uh, and have a less impact to your end users. They might not even need to know um, the implementations that's going on. Um, so this is a general use case. I see uh, a lot of applicability as we move through a lot of uh, replatforming and moving into cloud um, as we can put the virtualized layer there. So the next one is uh, here I'm gonna talk about is exploration use case. Uh, this, this and prototyping are like um, really help um, the analyst teams and you know the end users to understand the data before they start uh, putting in those business rules or you know understanding what the data patterns are. So they, they can uh, all take advantage of already built data fabric and then uh, uh, understand some of the prototyping uh, needs and uh, 
be able to access the data in real time uh, and then building upon it. Uh, once they get more insights, they can go into actually doing this as a physical implementation like in an ATL or uh, they can do it, uh, continue to do it as in a virtual layer. So that's a lot of um, uh, material on data virtualization and I hope you all learned a little bit about data virtualization today. Uh, let's take a little break and have some fun. And um, uh, I'm handing over to E for further um, from now. All over right. You, Thank you, Sabita. Yep, you shared a lot of good information today. And it's especially good to know when to and when not to use data virtualization. And just like the saying goes, when well, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like nail. So we should consider it as an addition instead of a replacement to our toolbox. Well, hope you guys are still there. We shared a lot. Now let's take a break and have some fun. So uh, Reagan, I will need your help uh, loading those trivia questions on the screen. So just respond when you see it. And yep. we will also go through it one by one together. Awesome. So I'm going to launch. There's a, there's four questions here in the first set. I'm going to launch the first one now. Uh, so everybody, uh, all the all the participants, um, you know, go ahead and, and put in your answers here. All right. So first question: Can data virtualization create a beautiful dashboard? Just pick a yes or no. Just a few more seconds. Go ahead and get your answers in there. There should be a, a small window that popped up on your screen. Uh, and go ahead, there's two, two potential answers here. So you can just click one of them. Take right, a while looks to like, guess. Yeah, it looks like we've got every, almost everyone voted. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now and share the results with everyone. So we had 64% of the responses say no and 36 say yes. Thank you, Reagan. And here I'm going to reveal the an correct answer, which is no. So you know that data virtualization sounds similar to data visualization and who doesn't like a beautiful dashboard, but you actually will need another tool to connect to it to build your beautiful dashboard. And next, look at question number two. Uh, again, you can launch the poll. Okay. Is data virtualization a black hole that will absorb all related data sets? All right. be yes or no. Yep, yes or no. And there's, um, again, there should be a window that popped up on your screen. And go ahead and submit your answers. I'm gonna give you all a few more seconds to think about it. All right, I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. So we had 25% say yes and 75% say no. All right. So the actual answer is no, actually. So it really does not physically move the data from A to B. That's why it's called virtualization. So it actually saved a lot of the heavy lifting moving data around. And then let's look at the third question. Uh, again, same poll will be launched. This do you question, have to go ahead. load? Yeah. Do you have to load your data into a single warehouse if you want to consume it from a single platform? Get your votes in. Few more seconds. It's a close one. Any last votes? All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share results. We had 45% say yes and 55% say no. Wow, that's that's pretty close. Well, let me reveal the actual correct answer which is no. I guess that's the reason why you're in this session to get to know the actual beauty of data virtualization because all your data inventory does not need to be moved into a single warehouse 
but you can still connect to them directly to those source systems from that single platform. And that's why we are, we are building this virtual data market. And last question. Can you connect to both prem, uh, cloud and on-prem data sources at the same time with data virtualization? Give you all a little bit longer to think about this one. Cloud, on-prem. All right, any last minute votes? Awesome. I'm going to end the poll and share results. We had 92% say yes and 8% say no. Wow, you guys are really good. I really paid attention to what Sabisa showed before. Uh, yep, all kinds of data systems, just regardless of on-prem or in the cloud, can be connected. All right, that's enough for a break. We'll have another round of trivia towards the end if time permits. And let's get back to the story time. How data virtualization saved the world, at least our world. Next, let me introduce you the hero, or I should say the other hero who will walk us through what the real world problem was, how it impacted our tier one program, and how data virtualization, the sharpest word, was used to conquer the data land. Now let's welcome Jijis Rikumari, data engineer, the data modeler, the virtual market builder, the circle of trust data ninja, the blueprint designer. Stage is yours, Jijis. Thanks, E, for a wonderful overview and trivia, and Sabida for going through all the technical details. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you understood the concepts of data virtualization by now. It's time to go through a use case that we implemented using data virtualization. So this is the request we got from our business partners. So I'm going to pause for a minute to let you read through the whole slide. Just kidding. Who is going to read a slide with a lot of words? That, that was what we thought. So let's make it simple. What does the business really want? The business wants more sales at a lower cost. Now, how can we achieve this? So we need to achieve efficiency in all phases of marketing activities. And for those of you who are not familiar with a marketing funnel, uh, here is a 50,000 feet overview of a marketing funnel. So it usually starts from uh, in the form of emails, social media ads, etc. And the next phase is the lead nurture stage and where the targeted contents, specials, ads, etc., are sent to the prospects. So this is where the marketing activities uh, gets converted to leads. The final phase is the sales, and that is where the actual sales happen and you know the prospects become the uh, customer. So now going back to my original question, how do we measure efficiency? Yes, you may have guessed it right, KPIs. So we need to define KPIs to quantify the effectiveness of each business, uh, key business objectives. I hope that is clear now. If it is still not clear, uh, let me translate it into data people's language. So all we want is some measures by some dimensions. I hope that is clear now. So does it look straightforward? Isn't that all we do day in and day out? What is the challenge? So like they say, you know, the first challenge of course is the complex business logic. Like they say, the devil is in the detail. So E, uh, help me out here. Let us go through a fun requirement gathering conversation. All right, Jijis. Show me percentage leads worked by months. Okay, what is worked? Have activities. Okay, what is by month? Well, leads had activities in that month. So what if a lead is worked in June, not in July, then in August? How do we calculate the percentage population? Jijis, stop the five wise, just do it. But I'm still on question three. So jokes apart, our business partners did spend time answering all the questions. They were patient and worked through all the details. But as we started writing the measures, more and more questions arose. Measures and calculations got more and more complicated throughout the design uh, phase. So the next challenge we faced is the complex data and analytics landscape. So as we started mapping the business requirements into our data sources, we realized that you know, uh, uh, the data we needed for this effort is spread all across the place. 
If you remember the initial example provided by E, at least she was lucky that she just needed to go to two stores, Costco and Target. But in our case, we had to go to Target, Giant Eagle, Trader Joe's, Kroger, everywhere to shop for our data, data needs. So to make, it to make the matter worse, some of the associations were difficult to establish in the underlying system. That is just because of the way the data was captured there. For example, multiple marketing emails could result in one qualifying lead. A lead can generate multiple sales or a sale can be associated with multiple leads. So you would think that these many to many associations can easily be resolved using a standard relationship table. But the fact of the matter is that the underlying system simply did not have data captured at that level. This takes us to the next problem, granularity. The granularity of the data was different across system. Some of the existing system captured data at the most granular level, and some had data aggregated at a certain level. So this means that we have to deal with billions of records in one system, millions here, and we always had to find the right level of aggregation before we could make any kind of association. The third problem we faced was latency. Some of our analytical stores had a latency of up to 48 hours. However, one of the asks from our business partners was to get access to near real-time data. So this prompted us to access some of the source systems directly to get a real-time view of the data. So now the solution, how did we solve this problem? Let us get to the specifics. So like I said in the previous slide, we have seven different sources spread across five heterogeneous stores. So if you see on my uh, screen on the left side, uh, we have campaign data classification data that is available in a Microsoft SharePoint. The marketing data, the email data is available in AWS S3 and we have decided to access via Athena. So before getting into uh, the rest of the system, let us address the second problem uh, we had, which was latency. So in order to, so all the Salesforce system introduced a delay of up to uh, 48 hours uh, to get into our analytical data stores. So in order to address that issue of latency, what we decided was to create a separate process that will replicate the Salesforce data into an Amazon RDS database every 20 minutes. The idea was you know, uh, to, uh, to refer the RDS database to get the near real-time data and go to Teradata for the historical information so that you know, we get best of both worlds. And last but not the least, our sales data was available in Netisa. So factoring the other two challenges we had, which is granularity and the complex business logic, we decided that a semantic layer is a must to create an abstraction layer. The idea was that this will provide a simple and unified layer to the business users. Simultaneously, we were also considering the standard, the traditional ETL batch process to bring all the data together. We knew that you know, this will result in making another copy of the existing data. But as we worked through the design, we realized that you know, most of the underlying system is either a database, data mart, or a data warehouse. In other words, there is a compute engine associated with all of these sources. So all we needed was to figure out a way to combine them somehow. So with, with that in mind, we decided to combine all the data sources virtually. Trust me, this wasn't an easy decision. We were one of the early adopters of this technology and hence had to do several POCs before we finalized this approach. So the virtual semantic layer came up with several benefits. It saved unnecessary data movement that was associated with a traditional ETL batch process. There was no more stale or delay, uh, delay report, single version of truth, abstraction, uh, so on and so forth. At the same time, we were also cautious about the performance of our report. So remember, we have two sets of users. One is our executives and other is our information worker. So we wanted to strike a good balance between the dashboard performance and the data freshness. So for the executives who usually access the CAN reports, we decided to use a data extract that will be uh, refreshed on a specific cadence and it will lie on the uh, reporting layer. For the information workers who, who need access to the latest and greatest data for their day-to-day -day job, we exposed them the virtual semantic layer. They could access this virtual semantic layer via a standard JDBC, ODBC, or API. 
So we had several iterations. The requirement changed on a continuous basis. We ran on a two week sprint. Uh, data virtualization gave us the agility to adopt to the evolving requirements. While the end customers see beautiful dashboard, I wanted to take you through what they do not see. And before that, you know, I wanted to share this picture to draw a comparison to our virtual semantic layer. A duck swimming in a pond seems to be moving without effort, but under the surface of the water, it is kicking its feet very hard. Similarly, do not let your data consumers see how hard you are working to get, to get them what they wanted. Just get the data. So when a user, when a user requests data from a semantic view, they may have no idea that you know the virtual semantic layer is getting data from several sources underneath. Uh, it it may be doing it may be cranking billions of billions and billions of records, doing all sort of computation or transformation to get use of what they want. A virtual semantic layer hides all that and on top of it gives real data. So this is the beauty of virtual semantic layer and data virtualization. That's all I have. I hope you enjoyed this. Back to you, E, uh, to get us through the remainder of the session. All right. Start my slide. And thank you, Didis. Um, it is truly epic. And special thanks for translating the complex requirement into human language. Uh, while you illustrated in simple words, but we did overcome some challenges, especially as the early adopters of this capability. However, once everyone's on board, it really helped us accelerate the solution development. So now back to you, audience. It's the trivia time again. And same as before, question will pop up on screen as polls. So, All right. I'm going to launch this first question. Did we end up purchasing a new tool for our project? Yes or no? Give you all a little bit more time in case you deviated away from the screen. You should have it popped up on your screen now. Any last votes? All right, I'm going to end the polling and share results. We had 44% of the audience say yes and 56% say no. Thank you, Reagan. Yeah, it's pretty close. Um, but the truth is we did not. So what actually happened is we identified a use case that we all, for a tool that we already own. So same for you. Feel free to explore options that's already in your toolbox. And you may not be aware that your significant other was smart enough and already stocked up on toilet paper. So next, let's look at question number two. Uh, how many data engineers were there to develop the virtualization layer in phase one? Take a wild guess. Just a few more seconds to get your vote in. All right, I'm gonna end the polling now and share results. We had 50% say one, 38% say two to five and 13% say five plus. Wow, that's amazing. So you guys are actually getting pretty close. The actual answer is two. So just me and Gigi's, um, actually this shows another benefit of data virtualization because by reducing the data heavy lifting, we can have a more agile development. So we were able to quickly build a prototype to consume for our program. All right, let's launch question number three. All right. Is all the build work visible to the end customer? This is if the last question of the session, so make sure to get your votes in.
few more seconds for some last minute votes or last second votes, I should say. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share results. We had 13% say yes and 88% say no. Wow, that's good. Actually, you probably all remember that cute duck picture that Didis shared, right? So what the customer will see is um, above the water, the visualization and analytical output. But behind the scene is the fundamental but important work, which is data engineering and data management. We should all appreciate that. And I do have an open-ended question. Uh, you don't have to answer right away. Just feel free to think about any similar situation in your work, problems you observed, write it down or type it down. Think about whether data virtualization is a possibility for you. And again, if we have time, we can come back to this later. And time flies. You probably consumed a lot of information today. So let's help you digest. Remember I said at the beginning, you'll be inspired to solve your life problem. And here you go. Rule number one, keep an eye on your toilet paper, stock up on it. No, that's not what you're looking for. That's fine. Rule number two, Data Mart or Warehouse is not the only solution to your data needs. Just like you don't always have to go to Costco for toilet paper. And rule number three, data virtualization is a good alternative. It enables end users to consume data directly on a single platform in real time without the need to physically move data into one location. It also provides an abstraction layer and has a physical implementation of the underlying data systems. And in human words, one stop shop free instant delivery of your data. Just remember the shopping experience and use it to explain data virtualization. It is your superpower now. And rule number four, both capabilities have their own benefits and use cases, just like shopping at store versus shopping online. And last but not least, be the first person in history to ever eat a lobster or tomato if you are a vegetarian. It is okay to be the early adopter and it will be a rewarding experience. We hope our use case can inspire you to check your toolbox and explore solutions that you wouldn't normally consider. All right, that's it for our stories. Hope you all enjoyed it. And thank you for accompanying us through the journey today. Feel free to connect with us or on LinkedIn. And next, we'll enter an exciting section, the free Q&A. I promise no credit card is required to ask questions. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Like she said, we are running into our uh, Q&A portion for the audience. So if you have questions, you know, feel free to, to throw them into the Q&A portion. Um, if you just look down, it should say Q&A at the bottom there. So um, if you have questions, just throw them in there and, and we'll get to them. But I, I have some questions for you all in the meantime, while we're, while our audience is thinking about um, maybe some questions to ask you. Um, the first is really around your experience, um, evaluating different options for basically find getting your data your disparate data sources to be in one location so i you know jajith you mentioned it's not etl so uh you know how, kind of walk us through that mentality of of saying well we're going to you know one option is we're going to take all of our data from these different sources build some sort of etl data pipeline store it in another source which is another view and then make that accessible versus an actual virtualization layer okay um so uh, yeah so so like i said our first thought was to go with etl but you know as we looked into the data sources right a lot of organization right have data already there in a database and keep in mind these databases are very powerful and if, if for some reason if your data is in multiple databases 
it's okay. You can, there are a lot of good virtualization tools that is available in the market that you could use to combine. And the third point is, right, we have, we, we are living in a world where we have a lot of new privacy laws coming up, like California privacy laws, NACHAS. So every data copy involves a lot of additional governance and privacy that we would not have factored in the past. So, so what we need to make sure is, do we really need another copy of data? Is there an alternative that can that we can use to prevent another copy of the data? Always, whenever you copy the data, there is always going to be a delay. They say stale report. So, so people who work in report, how many times you had to answer? You know, when you, when you get a question from your business, your answer would be, "Oh, that is just timing. The data did not flow through." So we deal with this day in and day out, and that was where, where we thought we would explore an alternative solution, give us give the business access to the closest data, the real-time data. And that was how we went through the journey. Got it. So latency was a, obviously a big consideration for you. And when you're moving massive amounts of data, I mean, that's, you know, that's definitely a lot of computational power. Um, we got a question from the audience asking, what tool did you end up using? Yeah. So we use uh, Denodo. Denodo is the tool we used uh, for this. So this was, uh, yeah, that's right. Great. Any other thoughts on the, the comparison and evaluation of like doing ETL and building it on your own versus finding a tool to help you do it? From Yi or, or Sabitha? So is this the self-service aspect, again that you're asking more from? Yeah, more so along the lines of when you're trying to, when you're evaluating different solutions or mechanisms to solve this problem that you are all faced with, you know, one is, is to build it yourself, like build the capability yourself and, and do the ATL work. The second is using the, the pre-existing tool. So did you just look within your organization or, or what, what were other considerations that, that you went through? So I can take a uh, first step and Sabita, you can add uh, after that. So when we first started, uh, Gigi, Gigi said, I just two of us as the data engineer. So we are looking at all those uh, possibilities and we reached out to some of the, uh, like the database uh, product owner, right? And then explore like what tool we can use. And then uh, data virtualization, this is one of the options. Like before that, we didn't even realize that this tool exists. In our, in our company, but then we get connected with the beta, the data architect who owns this capability. So she gave us like a very good uh, overview of what this capability is. And we explain what our problem was. So it's kind of like a, a match at the end. It's like our use case fits perfectly with this capability. So we start to uh, do some POCs on it. Uh, again, compared to like traditional ETL, which may require like more resource and then uh, more support from the infrastructure layer. And uh, it just happens that for us, for data virtualization, just between Gigi's and I, we're able to quickly turn around and then build POC, show it to our business customers, show it to the analyst, and then test the performance and then test the outcome and just to let them see how it tur quickly turned around. And again, also get the approval from our technology area leaders, Abisa, to uh, get close to us, make sure like we fit all the standard, all the requirements, and it's a good use case for this capability. So only thing I, I would like to add is we kind of go into a traditional mindset of moving this data, you know, in the data warehouse kind of world that still kind of the mentality in some cases, right? But business demands real-time access to the data. They don't want to have stale reports like Jijit mentioned. They don't want to have persisted copies of data which might become really cumbersome to navigate through. But if you build a semantic layer, it's easy to navigate for them to know where exactly the data is coming. And they want to make real-time decisions into the data without having to move this data because the data moment itself takes several hours sometimes from like, you know, depending on the volume of the data. And it's still okay because if you have data warehouse, you still need to go through that will be a batch process in the night that refreshes the data. But this is more like I need information now. I made a check payment and I want that to be updated in my mobile phone or I call somebody. I want to see the most recent updates on my transaction. Uh, this helps really to overcome some of those. Plus, 
um, we are a big organization. We have all kinds of data sources, like, you know, from legacy, like modern cloud, all those, right? Data is everywhere. This brings together everything in one uh, view there. I don't have to worry about, hey, it's coming from mainframe or it's coming from somewhere in the cloud. Uh, what is the connection I need to worry about? What data? As long as I'm getting this report, regardless where the business user doesn't have to worry about that, that is a huge uh, factor in consideration. Um, in, in originally, like we had this capability and we, we educate people when they have use cases and how to use, and then they realize, yeah, this is a great tool to kind of put that layer in and take advantage of it. It's interesting that you mentioned that too, um, because we start to see more and more business use cases and data science use cases that span across different domains. And when that starts happening, you start having these different underlying data management systems. And so in, in order to aggregate all that data together and be able to work with it, to your point, you know, it, it doesn't really care where the data source is living. And, and not to mention the, the whole cloud migration, people trying to move from system to system, um, you know, makes it really easy to do that. So, you know, I appreciate um, you all being on here and, and talking about this um, because I think it's extremely timely and a lot of organizations are still struggling with this. Um, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. There's one more question, if we can answer that one quickly. Um, the question was, were there any data transformation or conversions that you had to manage? So there were lightweight transformations that we had to manage. So you, are, you obviously need to bring in different heterogeneous data sources. You had to do joins. Uh, you had to do some filtering of the data because you don't want to bring in like, you know, billions of data if you don't want to. So obviously put some filtering conditions there, join conditions, and, uh, you know, some lightweight transformations to get to your, um, uh, you know, end state, but not heavy like aggregations or anything, because usually this is data is already in a data warehouse or data marts. It's aggregated and a lot of those things are done prior to even we, we put it in the consumer layer. So uh, it's a lightweight transformations to like, you know, join a filter aggregate and not aggregated, but other transformations that we used. Yes. Awesome. Thank you very much. And before we close out um, real quickly, I'm going to uh, share my screen just to show you the upcoming um, uh, next event that we have. Like I mentioned, I, I said that this was a two-part series, right? So we have today's, which was the use case, and then we'll also have the data virtualization um, second part of this vendor series on this Thursday, so in two days from now at the same time. Uh, and that's going to be a technical deep dive into the actual product itself. So if you are interested in understanding some of the more technical execution components of this or somebody on your team is interested in that potentially, um, you know, definitely encourage them to, to register for this. Like, like I said, these are all free and, and available to anyone to attend. So, um, you know, feel free to share this with, with your company or your network if you are interested in learning more. Um, and, and with that, I'd love to thank all, you know, all three of you for being here. What an excellent presentation. It was really entertaining. And um, thanks for putting those poll questions together to keep the audience engaged. So, um, you know, thanks again for being here. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. thank you. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday, and we hope to see you all on Thursday. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.